It is with great pride that I participate in this ceremony of the American University. I have chosen this time and place to discuss the most important topic on earth, peace. Not merely peace for Americans, but peace for all men and women. Not merely peace in our time, peace in all time. I graduated from American University in June of 1963. It was a very tense year. It came on the heels of the Cuba Missile Crisis. You know, we grew up being afraid of a nuclear bomb. There might not be any grown-ups around when the bomb explodes. Then, you're on your own. You just knew that every Russian was bad, and they wanted to destroy the world. There, there was no talk. If they hit us, we were going to hit them, and bango. The communist world was demonstrating its collective image of belligerence, power, and solidarity. President Kennedy brought in a whole new view of things. He was adored. He was loved around the world. He'd already delivered that incredible inaugural address. Ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. His call upon us as citizens to step forward, to be engaged, to, to look outward, began to create an excitement. He chose American University because American University had already developed a reputation for public service, for reaching out across the United States and across the world for students and faculty. So it was very, very exciting that he was going to speak at the graduation, at my graduation. Every graduate of this school who despairs of war and wishes to bring peace should begin by looking inward, by examining his own attitude towards the possibilities of peace. Too many think it is unreal, but that is a dangerous, defeatist belief. It was a very inspiring speech. I think he was setting a tone for the possibility of working toward world peace in a non-military way. We, we've never fought a war between the United States and the Soviet Union and he held out an olive branch. You know, we don't need to be enemies. We have different ideas and we have different interests, but we should be able to get along. And second, let us re-examine our attitude towards the Soviet Union. No government or social system is so evil that its people must be considered as lacking in virtue. It's remarkable, at the height of the Cold War, President Kennedy's speech was translated and broadcast almost in its entirety in Russian, the Soviet Union. We really were talking to the Russians and certainly no one was expecting the blockbuster announcement that came. I now declare that the United States does not propose to conduct nuclear tests in the atmosphere so long as other states do not do so. The speech for those of us who were present was the call for action. We were asked to participate. We were asked to become part of history. No, I think I was very, very directly inspired by that speech. He caused all of us to think differently, think more inclusively, and step forward to make things better for all of us. President Kennedy was trying to look beyond antagonistic speech, trying to show the importance of judgment, the importance of context, the importance of taking the other into account. It was a moment of arrival for the university. Uh, a point at which the university's reputation was on the rise. After that speech, uh, I would find myself lecturing uh, either in India or Brazil or Australia. And people say, American University, the speech, the Kennedy speech. I said, yes. At this point, where the university is with the programs to bring the awareness of the global community to our students and to involve them is a result of some of the things that occurred here on campus the day that he made the announcement. Genuine peace must be the product, product of, of many nations. nations, the sum of many acts. It must be dynamic, not static, changing to meet the challenge of each new generation. For peace is a process a way of solving problems. Confident and unafraid, we must labor on, not towards a strategy of annihilation, but towards a strategy of peace.
Well, I'd like to welcome everybody here today. I'm Jim Goldgaard, Dean of the School of International Service, and it's a great pleasure to welcome you here to the Abramson Family Founders Room for this uh, wonderful event. Uh, as part of the series of American University events commemorating the 50th anniversary of President Kennedy's commencement address here at American University, widely regardless, regarded as one of the best, if not the best, foreign policy addresses given uh, by a president, and we're very proud of that address, that that address was here in 1963, and we've been doing a series of events across the campus uh, looking at different aspects of the speech and thinking about the speech uh, in the context of our, uh, of uh, what's going on in the world today. Uh, we're quite thrilled today that this event is our uh, Meet the Press at SIS uh, event with uh, our distinguished guest, David Gregory, uh, SIS alumnus uh, and host uh, of Meet the Press, uh, and Israeli Ambassador Michael Oren. We are hosting this event here at SIS with the Center for Israel Studies, which is in the uh, College of Arts and Sciences, and uh, with whom uh, we've had uh, numerous uh, held numerous events uh, during the course of this year. We did one on the Israeli election. Uh, we did one uh, called Iran and the Bomb. We did one on uh, President Obama's Middle East policy with Ambassador Dennis Ross, a whole host of events. And it's just been a great pleasure, as it always is, to work with Laura Cutler uh, from the center uh, on uh, the events that we've been able to do uh, together. It is, uh, in fact, uh, the, uh, the 15th uh, anniversary year of the center. Uh, I'm going to let uh, David in, uh, introduce Ambassador Oren, but I just wanted to say that, uh, of course, we're so proud uh, that David Gregory is an alumnus uh, of SIS, and uh, not only uh, are we proud that he's an alumnus, we're also thrilled uh, with his uh, generous support of the school and his willingness uh, to come over to campus uh, to do events here with us. We, we are extremely grateful to him. Uh, and uh, he will, uh, as, as he does so well, moderate this event and take questions. I would just urge all of you, I know uh, uh, that we have people in this room as well as uh, currently in the building uh, who uh, have a range of perspectives, which is how we like it here in the School of International Service. And I would just ask everyone to remember that we are at an academic institution and so we do expect respect uh, for different points of view. Uh, and look forward to an engaging conversation. So with that, I turn it over to David Gregory. Thank you, uh, Jim. It's great to be here. Always fun to come back to, uh, to campus, uh, you know, to talk about big and important matters um, dating back to the time that I was a student here and uh, the first Gulf War was happening. Uh, you know, the, the, the thinking about, the study of, the debate about the Middle East uh, was certainly important then, even more so, so now. Um, and so it's great to be able to have Ambassador Oren here to talk about some of these issues. Uh, a couple of points. I mean, the context here is interesting and important. Um, as we celebrate President Kennedy's address on campus and we, we look at the Cold War struggles over nuclear weapons and the nuclear threat by looking through the prism in the Middle East, it's both really topical, really important. But that is the context of this discussion. As I look at protesters uh, upstairs and so forth, let's be clear about what this is not. This is not intended to be a debate about um, Israeli-Palestinian disputes over territory. No doubt that will come up in, in some fashion as I've got the Israeli ambassador here. But I think on behalf of the school and certainly on the behalf of you know, the work I do, if we were going to have that discussion, you would have had both sides represented. It would have been framed as a debate. Ambassador Oren is an historian as well as a representative of the Israeli government. And so I hope we all see that in that, in that proper context. Uh, I've known the ambassador uh, for a good while, and it's been a pleasure to know him. He's been ambassador since 2009, uh, born and educated in the United States uh, at Princeton uh, and elsewhere, and, uh, and an author of some fabulous books that uh, you may know or should know or should certainly take the time to read. Power, Faith, and Fantasy is One, America in the Middle East from 1776 to the present and Six Days of War, about the 67 War, which is uh, also a must read, both of those bestsellers. Uh, so a brief introduction to uh, Ambassador Oren. Michael, good to see you. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you for promoting my books. I'm not allowed yes. to promote my books myself now. Right, but, but I'm um, happy to. They are available at 
famously reduced prices now on Amazon. So um, you should know. Um, and it's a great uh, honor to be back with American University. I think it's, I've spoken more frequently on this campus than any other campus in America. Uh, to be at the Center for Israel Studies, Laura Cutler, for the pioneering work you do. And to be speaking on the occasion of the anniversary of President Kennedy's um, historic commencement speech here. I, as an historian, David mentioned I was an historian before getting into this work and um, had the privilege of doing some research in Kennedy Presidential Library in Boston about Kennedy's relationship with the Middle East and more specifically with Israel. Kennedy in his inaugural address, the presidential inaugural address, talked about supporting any friend and Israel was certainly uh, a friend uh, to President Kennedy. Uh, he was the, the president who first uh, provided Israel with weaponry. The United States didn't have a military alliance with Israel, with Israel in the 1960s. The Hawk missiles were provided uh, by President Kennedy. He was the first uh, um, uh, American president to meet um, openly with a, an Israeli prime minister, he met with Prime Minister Ben-Gurion. And, um, and we have reciprocated. Israel is the only country in the Middle East that has a memorial to President Kennedy uh, in the forest outside of Jerusalem. So it's a great honor yeah. for me to be here. Well, let's talk about the, that particular speech at a time of, uh, of great threat of nuclear conflict between the Soviet Union and the United States. And the, the, the spirit of that message from President Kennedy was engagement with an adversary. And some worked toward disarmament to both, there was protection involved, but also some nod toward a day when we'd see far fewer of those uh, weapons. And yet now, the prospect of nuclear uh, conflict is certainly abated between the United States and Russia, but in your part of the world, it's a real threat. Talk a little bit about the state of that at the moment from, from how you see it. Well, we have a, um, an Iranian regime that we believe is seeking military nuclear capabilities. I think the United States believes that as well, as well as other allies in the world. Um, the Iranian regime is, is uh, fundamentally different than the Soviet Union, which was a, a rational actor and understood the, the calculus of mutually assured destruction. And we cannot be certain about that in terms of the Iranian worldview. It, uh, it, it has not so much an ideology as it has a theology. Um, and it is capable of, of irrational acts. Uh, planning a terrorist attack in downtown Washington is an irrational act. Uh, planning to blow up the Israeli embassy not far from here uh, would have been a rational act. Um, and the Iranian regime, if it acquires these capabilities, it's not just the danger that it's going to stick a, a warhead on top of one of the missiles that it already has. And these missiles at this point can not only reach any city within Israel and any city in the Middle East, but can each reach most of Eastern Europe and is making its way toward Western Europe. Um, that is one danger, but Iran is also the leading state sponsor of, uh, of terrorism in the world. And if Iran gets these capabilities, it means the terrorists get the capabilities. And you don't need a missile. All you need is a ship container. Uh, and how do you defend the world from that? And then once Iran acquires military nuclear, nuclear capabilities, we know of several Middle Eastern states that will seek to follow suit. So uh, if Iran gets nuclear weapons, We'll be looking at a Middle East that not only uh, has uncertain arsenals of chemical weaponry, and there's been much on the news about that recently, but we'll be looking at a Middle East which is unstable and has nuclear arsenals. And if that is the case, do the old rules apply? You know, mutually assured destruction, the idea of deterrence, or the ability, as Kennedy talked about, to actually deal with any number of adversaries who have a nuclear arsenal. But then that was in a, a bipolar nuclear world. Now we're talking a profoundly multipolar nuclear world in a multipolar, profoundly unstable uh, nuclearized region, which we hope won't evolve. Um, but um, again, how do you deter a, a terrorist organization that has access to ship containers? I don't want to belabor the image, but it's there. Um, how do you uh, deter uh, governments that, uh, regimes that may not be uh, too stable? And how do you deter um, leaders who have apocalyptic medieval outlooks and hegemonic, hegemonic aspirations, not just for the region, but for the world. Um, you know, there, there, are two, there are two militaries in the world that divide the world into uh, theaters of operation. There is the United States military and there's the Iranian government. And th there's a reason, because they have that, that aspiration. The difference, though, is the ability to act on the aspiration, right? I mean, the U.S. They aspire to acquire that ability. Yeah. And they can do that through, if Iran goes nuclear, talk, I mean, you're, you're making reference to it, but if Iran becomes a nuclear power, and if this administration is not able to prevent it from doing that, which is said 
is still the stated goal, then what, what follows? And tell me the time frame. I don't know the time frame, but uh, what follows, and the time frame is not in the, in the tremendously distant future. We talk about a window for diplomacy and sanctions um, that is open, but not open very widely and not for long. Uh, we don't think that, 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 that there's an abundance of time remaining. But um, if uh, other states in the Middle East uh, acquire military nuclear capabilities, then there's the danger that the very notion of uh, non-proliferation, nuclear non-proliferation, becomes an oxymoron. And that uh, proliferation becomes global. And how do you prevent many states from acquiring nuclear weapons once a, a good number of Middle Eastern states acquire nuclear weapons? So what is then, you know, the, the lesson of what Kennedy was speaking of, which was ultimately getting to a place of a test ban treaty and then some disarmament. Uh, that's something that's been carried on through the decades. And indeed, but post 9-11, American governments have been focused on the idea of non-proliferation and trying indeed. to limit that in, in Iran and throughout the Middle East. Mm -hmm. well, I think that uh, the, the notion that someday the Middle East could be free of weapons, uh, of all weapons of mass destruction, not just nuclear weapons, but also chemical weapons, biological weapons, I is an American goal, but it's also an Israeli goal. Mm -hmm. And, um, and we look forward to that day. We think that uh, peace is the essential precondition for that. And that once there are peaceful relations between Israel and its neighbors, then we could look forward to a region that is free of all of these weapons of mass destruction. Even your own? Even whatever weapons we have. Israel has said now for, let's see, more than a half a century that it will, be not, it will not be the first uh, country to introduce nuclear weapons to the Middle East. That was our policy at the time of Kennedy's administration. It remains our policy today. The ability for, let me ask it this way, what is the difference between uh, Israel's ability to start to reach out to adversaries like Iran and the U.S.'s ability? Because one of the things that President Obama said was, we're going to give this a shot. We're going to try to reach out to them and see if we can get them to negotiate. And we supported it. Um, we, were, we were supportive of the, of the, of the engagement policy. We were, import, we were supportive of the reassessment of that engagement supporting. At the uh, President's first meeting with Prime Minister Netanyahu in May of 2009, I was just coming on the job, that was uh, one of the first agreements we had, that, the, that Israel would back an attempt by the United States to engage the Iranian leadership, even to reach a compromise formula in which a um, large part of its, um, the bulk of its uh, stockpile of enriched uranium would be shipped abroad to be in, to enrich to a higher level for the use in, in uh, medical isotopes at the Tehran Research Reactor. Um, it, that we supported that. that. That offer was made in November of 2009, uh, and the Iranians, alas, rejected it, as they've rejected every compromise proposal since then. Um, we have the greatest stake, and I, I want to say this in the most unequivocal terms: Israel has the greatest stake in resolving the Iranian nuclear threat by diplomatic means. We have the most skin in the game. If anybody does anything against Iran, we will pay the price for it. And uh, the Iranians make uh, no mistake about it. They make, they make no attempt to dissemble the fact that, that they, would, uh, they would exact vengeance on us. So we have the greatest stake. What we have to, though, is be honest. We've given now uh, time for sanctions. We've seen the sanctions have worked very well as sanctions. They've taken a huge chunk out of the Iranian economy. They've sent the Iranian currency into a nosedive, uh, but they haven't had an impact on the Iranian nuclear program, which according to the UN inspectors has actually advanced, and they're uh, not only building new facilities, but installing uh, advanced centrifuges that could triple the, the rate of enrichment and greatly uh, constrict the breakout time uh, should they decide to break out. Um, the uh, diplomacy, um, we've seen the position of the P5 plus one, the five, five permanent members of the Security Council uh, plus Germany, their position has inc become increasingly flexible over the last, certainly in the last year of negotiations. The Iranian position has not moved a millimeter. Um, so we say we want to give time to sanctions, we want to give time to diplomacy, but the Iranian nuclear program is advancing and advancing to the point where, as Prime Minister Netanyahu told the General Assembly last fall, it will reach the point where we will no longer be able to prevent Iran from getting a nuclear weapon. Um, and then it becomes how, however long it takes them to make the weapon may become immaterial because we won't even know about it. So what, what should the Obama administration do about it? What can it do about it? Well, we believe still that a combination of escalating punishing sanctions, 
uh, combined with a, uh, a, credible nuclear, a credible military threat uh, stands the best chance of dissuading the Iranian leadership from pursuing these uh, capabilities. Why? Right now, the Iranian leadership understands it's paying a price. It's paying a high price, billions of dollars, tens of billions of dollars uh, for its military nuclear program. But they believe that at the end of the day, they're going to succeed. They're going to have the thing itself. They're going to have the device. And that will enable them not only to realize their regional and global aspirations, but it will also uh, reassure uh, regime survival. They look what happened to Gaddafi in Libya, and they saw what happens to a leader in the Middle East when he gives up his military nuclear program. He goes away very fast. You get NATO in your backyard. And so they, they, they're willing to pay a very, very high price. They have not internalized that they're paying that price for naught, that at the end of the day, they won't have the device. There will be a credible military threat that will stop them. That's why all options on the table, which is the position of President Obama, it's the position of, of the government of Israel, is very important. We have to endow that all options on the table policy with credibility so that the Iranian leaderships, and particularly one Iranian leader, the Supreme Leader, internalizes that at the end of the day, all of this is for nothing because they won't have the device. But then you have Syria. The president has said, you use chemical weapons, you cross the red line, it changes our calculus. Even the most uh, hawkish members uh, of the Republican Party at the moment, John McCain, Lindsey Graham, do not want to see U.S. forces going into Syria mm -hmm. to try to either affect regime change, manage regime change if Assad goes, or even if it was just a matter of securing chemical weapons. How much of a complication is Syria, and what does that tell you about U.S. willingness mm -hmm to commit forces, to commit to a military option with regard to Iran? We don't think you should look at the Syrian example and derive conclusions about Iran. There, first of all, there's, there's a, a, a vast difference in, a, of magnitude of threat. Uh, the Syrian uh, chemical arsenal, which is the largest chemical arsenal in the Middle East, it's one of the largest in the world, uh, presents a serious danger uh, to Israel, uh, not just Israel, to some of our neighboring countries, friends of the United States, and, and we're following this. Um, continuously at the highest uh, levels, an intimate ongoing discussion. Uh, the Iranian nuclear threat is an existential threat. An existential threat. We have an Iranian regime that's actually saying that it's going to wipe uh, a member state of the UN, us, off the map, and saying it with such frequency that it doesn't get even reported in the, in the American press anymore. Um, it's become so, so commonplace. Uh, so it's a different order of magnitude. Um, the Syrian situation is immensely complex. Um, um, whether there, there are no simple military solutions. Um, the word plumage becomes very important here, the question of whether you, by somehow interdicting the Iranian uh, uh, chemical threat, you can cause collateral damage to, to civilians. You don't want to do that. It, it is immensely complex. We are making no recommendations uh, to the United States about how to respond to this, um, contrary to what has been alleged in some leading newspapers here in the United, in the United States. We are not uh, pressing any, any particular policy. We're not uh, pressuring or recommending. But we are communicating very, very closely about it. And uh, I'll stop there. Okay. All my head. As we, as we look at the Middle East of today, the nuclear threat, um, the devolution of power, how would Saddam Hussein still being in power, but subjected to the kind of punishing sanctions that were on the verge of melting away before the right. invasion, how would his uh, survival in life and uh, as a dictator in Iraq have affected the reality in the Middle East today? Well, I, I, it's, a, it's a hypothetical and a hypothetical sort of thing. Uh, what we can say uh, empirically is that Israel mounted a raid on the Iraqi nuclear reactor in 1981. We did so with the understanding that we would gain one year in that program. One year is a long time in the Middle East. You may have noticed things can change very rapidly. In the Middle East before, I was sitting with, the, with, the, with your president and saying, you know, if you give an introductory course on the Middle East at American University today, you know how the course starts, but you don't necessarily know how the course ends. Because um, the situation is so fluid in the Middle East and so flammable. Um, we thought we'd gain a year, and to this day, Iraq does not have nuclear weapons. Um, what I think that had, um, had Saddam Hussein acquired military nuclear capabilities, then the course or even the outbreak of the first Gulf War, to say nothing of the second Gulf War, might have been much different. Um, again, it's a hypothetical, 
But if we use the example of, say, North Korea, we see how hesitant uh, powers are to uh, intercede uh, militarily against a con country which, you know, by any standards is quite primitive but has a, a, a nuclear arsenal. But the idea of what became the idea, I mean, the, the idea for the invasion of Iraq was about eliminating a, a, a threat from weapons of mass destruction that did not exist, or at least uh, eliminating a capacity because that was the extension from a terror attack on 9-11 to terrorists getting weapons of mass destruction, which you referenced just a short while ago. Um, but the notion that became prominent was the idea that uh, pushing a freedom agenda in Iraq ultimately has a cascading effect on the Middle East. And if President Bush at least was a precursor to, to the events roiling the Middle East, um, you, you know, we see a lot of the dangers associated with the introduction of greater freedoms into the Middle East. So I go back to our, you know, what brings us together today, the notion that the Cold War, and as it extended to the Middle East, was about preserving some level of stability to keep one side pitted against the other, but to maintain the deterrent value. What's happened in the Middle East, um, just across the board, that is making it so much more dangerous? What we see in the Middle East now is, is the unraveling of, a, um, of an order that was created uh, by the Europeans in 1916 um, with the anticipation of the, uh, the dissolution of the Ottoman Empire, the Sykes-Picot order, uh, where borders were drawn to meet European interests, um, sort of without uh, any thought about ethnic concentrants, uh, co ethnic uh, communities, tribal uh, allegiances. Um, and um, the Cold War was predicated on the existence of a state system uh, that, it was, that grew out of that order. Um, and uh, it, it, it was an order that you know, it lasted 100 years. It was like the European state system created the Congress of Vienna in 1815, <laughs> lasted 100 years to, to the outbreak of World War I. You could probably derive some theory about that, about the longevity of state orders. But um, the, uh, that type of, to the degree that it rendered any stability, and let's not, over, over, let's not overstate the case for stability. We had, uh, depending on how it's counting, between six and eight Arab-Israeli wars during that period, many other regional wars, wars between uh, Yemen, uh, the Yemen civil war, with a proxy war between Egypt and Saudi Arabia. We had uh, conflicts with Jordan. We had conflicts between Libya and Egypt that had nothing to do with the Arab-Israeli conflict. Syria invading Jordan, you know, trying to invade Jordan in 1970, had nothing to do with the Arab-Israeli conflict, um, or little to do. Um, that stability shouldn't be overstated, but even then, compared to today, where we don't know where the, the future of the state order is going, what Syria will look like in another year, will it be trifurcate, will it uh, balkanize, will it atomize, we don't know. Um, that calls into question many of our assumptions that we have, we have, we have held as axiomatic for, for many decades now. And it has forced a lot of rethinking on our part too, uh, and certainly on the part of our, our American allies about how we're gonna try to grapple with this future. And there's a tremendous amount of uncertainty, I must tell you. We hope, what do we hope? We hope for the emergence of uh, coherent, peace-loving, uh, democratic uh, governments and countries throughout the entire Middle East. Um, that's our hope. And, that, and to the degree to which we can impact that, and again, I don't want to overstate our ability to impact what's going on in Syria, certainly not as Israelis or even as Americans, impact the internal situation in Syria, impact the internal situation in Egypt or any other country, we want to achieve peace with the Palestinians. There are some people in the world say, why would you want to give up territory right now with so much uncertainty out there? Because this is actually something we can hope, we can actually work to try to improve. Uh, it's something we can affect, try to reach peace with the Palestinians. We'll do that. What's the prevailing goal, do you think, in some of the dissolution of the state order? I mean, I, I referenced when we were speaking earlier that my study here at AU included in, within SIS, I studied international relations, but I also studied Palestinian nationalism by understanding the breakup of the Ottoman Empire and understanding the, the evolution of, of nationalism from Europe and its introduction into the, the pre-dissolved Ottoman Empire and understanding that there was uh, only later the idea of sort of land-based sense of nationhood, that there was this period of pan-Arabism and, and Nasser in, in Egypt of, uh, of uh, the, the sort of cultural um, uh, Arab identity, cultural Arab nationalism uh, that ultimately, in the case of the Palestinians, becomes about land. 
I mean, here you have various strains who are, there are ethnic and, and tribal differences which affect uh, the map. There are certainly those younger people who would like to see uh, democratic order. And then, of course, you know, altogether different, which is, you know, religious, uh, religiously inspired uh, desires for a return to the caliphate, mm -hmm. which is, uh, y you know, a lot of jihadism. So what do you see uh, as dominant right now? Um, it's so great because I can't really ask these questions on Meet the <laughs> Press because oh I'd have to take a commercial and then and say goodbye after the question. And then, no, no, you have to put, <laughs> can we pause for station identification? Yeah. <laughs> Wait, this, do they still do that? Um, this, is, this, is a, this is a test of the emergency broadcasting yeah, system. Exactly. Had this been a real emergency? Um, you know how people are old enough to they're, they're yeah. laughing. They don't do that anymore. Um, you put me in a difficult position because on one hand, I'm an ambassador, but I also want to ask you, answer your question as an historian. Right, so I was let hoping me, you let would. Let me, let me I skirt a very delicate do line here. And that is to say that um, the history of the Middle East going back now, a hundred and all, since the, many historians uh, mark the, um, the advent of the modern Middle East with the Napoleonic invasion of, of Egypt in 1798. Many Middle East departments, if you take a an intro course on the, uh, of the modern Middle East, will begin in, in July 1798. For that reason, it's the point where the West sort of egresses into the Middle East and presents the peoples of the Middle East with a challenge. Uh, how come we're losing this battle? How come they're coming with better armies? How come they're coming with stronger currencies, economies? Why aren't we better able to cope right. the way we used to cope in, in during the medieval period? And not only cope, but actually prevail. And there are generations of, of responses to the challenge of the West. One of the responses that Napoleon has a better army. So let's get cannons like them. Let's bring in instructors like them. Let's modernize our militaries. That didn't work. That actually led to, the result was greater European conquest in the Middle East. A next generation comes on. What they have that we don't have is uh, constitutional government. Let's bring in, let's make constitutions. Uh, and you see this in, Tun in Tunis of the 1870s and in, in, in 60s. You see it in Egypt of the 1860s and 1870s. But Tunis become, Tunisia becomes part of France and Egypt becomes part of Britain. It doesn't, it doesn't work. But beginning in, again, almost the same period, you have a, a, a group of, um, of Arab Muslim thinkers who say, no, we don't have to take anything from the West. We have it. We actually have the answer here. It's called Islam. And all we have to do is turn back to our own roots. Islam's the answer. Um, almost at the same time, you had other people who were looking to the West and say, what they have that we don't have is nationalism. Let's become nationalists. And, and whether it was the canon or the constitution, or nationalism was to take a piece of the West and use it against the West. Uh, nationalism in the Middle East was, was very, was, was some, we're taking ideas, Western ideas, and using it as Nasser did against the West. I, facing up to him was the Muslim Brotherhood, who tried to assassinate Nasser and paid a very heavy price for it. Uh, Nasser you know, cruelly suppressed the Muslim Brotherhood. That tension exists today. The tension exists today between ideas that are taken from the West. Uh, inspired by the West, aren't necessarily used against the West anymore, and that conflict with uh, the, those who say, we don't have to take anything from the West, we have it already, all we have to be is truer to our own traditions. You know, Islam is the answer. Um, that tension uh, remains to this day, you see it played out in, in the streets of Cairo. You're going to see it to a certain day played out in the streets of, of Damascus uh, in Aleppo. Um, I think, for those of you who are studying history, I think having that historical perspective uh, helps you understand the contemporary situation in the Middle East and, and really put it into some type of context. That there, these aren't necessarily new uh, events, they're just a continuation of struggles that have gone on for some time. Um, and how it plays out, I'm going to fall back to that uh, famous answer that uh, Chou Enlai, uh, the leader of China, gave to uh, Henry Kissinger when he asked him whether he thought the French Revolution was a success. Remember what Cho said? Mm. It's too early to tell. <laughs> 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 but you have the difficulty of representing a government that cannot just sort of wait it out. Um, and this is true of the, of the U.S. government and a lot of European governments, too, who look at the region and think about, you know, intervention. I mean, one of the, uh, Richard Haas in this, uh, this month's uh, or quarter's Foreign Affairs magazine has written about uh, the U.S. approach to the region right now. And, and the conclusion, more or less, is that the, the grand strategic approach of the United States will be to do little and, and see what that does. In other words, not have a big strategic overlay to the region, but see how some events play out and see where it can make a difference um, along the way. Um, how do you interpret that as uh, the wisdom of that? 
well, I have nothing but the highest regard for Richard Haas, but I'm not going to sort of you know, debate him or, or criticize him by proxy. Um, I think that uh, the United States, from an Israeli perspective, the United States is a sovereign country. We're a sovereign country. Uh, we each have to make our own decisions how best to defend ourselves, how best to react to events in the Middle East. And I'm not going to prescribe for the United States how it can best achieve those goals. Um, but what I would say, I don't think that there's a, a cookie cutter policy for the many and uh, multifaceted challenges we're facing in the Middle East. Um, and I think it's going to um, involve some, some tremendous uh, policy making, uh, creativity, and, and, um, and, 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 and deep strategic thought. Um, we have to. You know, to any policymaker has to decide between you know the, the famous uh, dilemma of um, creating a bucket brigade or creating a firehouse. Are you aware of this? Um, bucket brigade is what you use to put out a fire immediately. We want to create a firehouse to think long down the line and how we're going to uh, put out those fires. All of us want to create firehouses, um, but on a daily basis, we're called to pick up buckets. And um, you know, we've had the situation now in Syria, which is truly a, a bucket situation where we have the question of who's in control of chemical weapons. In Israel, we have the question of uh, a possible, um, uh, not just a regime that's closely linked to Iran killing its own civilians, but also the rise of, of Salafist elements there who are equally inimical to the notion of a sovereign Jewish state in our region. Um, that's classic bucket for Jordan. Um, Jordan now is saddled with at least 500,000 refugees. The king was in uh, Washington last week. He talked about the possibility of that number doubling in a short period of time for a population of Jordan, six million people. It's, it, it's a huge burden. And, and uh, Jordanian security and stability is vital not just for Israel's security, uh, but for, for a number of, of issues. So we want to be able to look down the road, David, and build the firehouse. It's not easy. The, 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 the complication, even when it comes to peace between Israelis and Palestinians in this context, is uh, who is your real partner? Mm -hmm. And how do you resolve that given all this surrounding chaos when you have to feel some sense of, of, of urgency about making both compromises, concessions, and ultimately a deal for fear of the consequences of failing to do that for too much longer? The government of Israel is committed to uh, achieving an historic peace with the Palestinian people based on two states for two peoples, a nation state of the Jews called Israel, with living side by side with a nation state of the Palestinian people um, in a situation of permanent peace, security, and mutual recognition. But because of those factors that you cited, we also have to prepare for the possibility that the peace won't be maintained, that the peace could you know, un unravel. And we've had some very bad experiences with efforts we've made to advance peace, whether pulling our troops out of southern Lebanon, pulling all of our presence out of Gaza in 2005, and not getting peace, getting thousands of rockets fired at our civilians. So while, pursu while pursuing peace, we keep our eyes very wide open and look at ways in which we can ensure our security should that peace not be maintained. And the two are inseparable in our view. What does the administration do now to reanimate a peace process that really hasn't been going anywhere? Well, we've uh, I recently come back from uh, escorting, uh, accompanying uh, Secretary of State uh, John Kerry to the region. Uh, he's deeply committed to reanimating this peace process. We are equally uh, dedicated. We look forward to uh, hosting him again. Um, and the, the key here is to um, get the Palestinian leadership in the West Bank. Now we're talking about uh, um, President Abbas to sit down at the negotiating table with us. Now um, for four years, he's for the most part has been unwilling to do that. Our position, the position of the Obama administration is calls for the immediate renewal of direct talks without preconditions on all the core issues, whether it be borders, security, mutual recognition, refugees, Jerusalem. These are all core issues. We're willing to negotiate all of them uh, to reach this historic peace that I mentioned based on two peace for two peoples. But the, the only precondition we have is to have them sit at the table. Without that, we're not going to get very far. But is it your fear, as it's been the fear of, of other countries, uh, whether it's King Abdullah or Tony Blair in Great Britain, uh, or even you know, Bill Clinton, that until and unless there's an Israeli-Palestinian deal, 
that, uh, that some of these other problems in the region cannot be solved. Do you think that thinking is still operative, given what's roiling the Middle East at the moment? I think that um, no one's under the illusion that solving an Israeli, uh, Israeli Palestinian problem will solve all of Egypt's economic problems or, so, or end the civil war in Syria. Um, we want to affect positively um, any part of the Middle East that we can. We feel that we can do this on the Palestinian plain. Um, we feel that, uh, that if we can get to the Palestinians to the negotiating table, and the Prime Minister, Prime Minister Netanyahu has said this, that once the Palestinians come to the negotiating table, he believes that very swiftly, and in Middle Eastern terms swiftly, we can reach that historic peace, and that all of the issues can be worked out. Settlements, he, he, Net Netanyahu got up in front of a joint session of Congress two years ago and says, let's be honest with ourselves, they're going to be Israeli settlements, they're going to lie beyond our borders. Settlements are not going to be the obstacle here. Uh, on Jerusalem, he says that with uh, creativity and, and goodwill, we can solve the Jerusalem problem. Nothing here is unsolvable. The basic, we believe, the basic preconditions, the basic building blocks are peace, our mutual recognition. We recognize that there's a Palestinian people endowed with an unassailable right to self-determination in the area that the Palestinians regard as their homeland. We need the Palestinians to recognize that there is a Jewish people that enjoys the exact same status and the same rights. Um, and we believe that once we sign on the dotted line, there's peace. It has to be an end of claims, an end of conflict. That means that there's not, the conflict doesn't go on from there and there's irredentist claims. The refugees, the Palestinian refugees, will be settled in the Palestinian state and not in Israel. We believe this is achievable if the Palestinians enjoy at the table and that we can positively affect the, the, uh, the region. It will not solve all the problems of the Middle East, but it certainly won't help, or it won't hurt it. And, um, and maybe. Some people, if, if peace brings true prosperity to the Palestinians in the West Bank, maybe the people of Gaza will get the message too and think that Hamas is not the way. It, it is, you talk about affecting change in the broader Middle East. This is one way to do it. A country like Egypt, if it survives politically under this uh, uh, administration, perhaps can, can be an element for change. But how do you view President Morsi right now and Egypt? Is, uh, is he a friend, a foe, something else? Well, we, um, we greatly value our peace with Egypt. You know, it goes back to, to 1979. It's really been the cornerstone of Israel's strategic and, and diplomatic uh, regional outlook uh, since then. And, um, and it's not only an Israeli interest, that peace. It's not only an Egyptian interest. It's an American interest. It's a regional interest. We think it's a global interest maintaining that peace. And we think that the Egyptian government understands that. Um, the Muslim, we have no illusions about the nature of the Muslim Brotherhood and the, the place in which a sovereign Jewish state has in their, uh, in their outlook, in their traditional theology. Um, but we prefer to look not at, at what uh, Morsi and his government says, but what they do. And uh, last November, when we had uh, um, fighting with Hamas and other terrorist organizations in, in Gaza, the Egyptian government uh, played a constructive role in uh, cooperating with then Secretary of State Clinton in reaching in a ceasefire. Um, and we hope that they'll continue to uh, play that a constructive role. Meanwhile, we have some outstanding um, issues uh, with the Egyptian government, not the least of which is the paradoxical situation is in Cairo, where we used to have an embassy, the embassy was destroyed. We have an ambassador without an embassy. And there is in Tel Aviv an Egyptian embassy without an ambassador in it. Uh, they withdrew their ambassador. So we, we want to address, uh, redress these paradoxes and get onto a more uh, stable uh, situation. But right now, um, we, um, we recognize that the Egyptian government is maintaining the peace, and that is absolutely crucial for us.